Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Liz Watson, the Executive Director of the Congressional Progressive Caucus Center, and I'm coming to you live today from my dining room table. Uh, and I wanted to have a chance to speak with you today a little bit about uh, the, the coronavirus response legislation, what's going on in Congress, uh, what progressives are pushing for, and ways to get involved. So. I, like many of you, um, am in the process of, uh, you know, just to give you a, a sense of what's going on here, uh, trying to take care of a, a nine-year-old and a 13-year-old and, and also uh, teleworking and doing my job uh, and, and trying to really throw down, along with so many amazing progressive activists across the movement, um, at this really important, critical moment in time for our country. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about what the Congressional Progressive Caucus Center does. Um, for those of you who might not know, and, and of course, um, thank you so much uh, for those of you who are joining in with us on the, on the broadcast here today. So the Congressional Progressive Caucus Center is a nonprofit that works with activists and grassroots organizations and progressive thinkers all across the progressive movement to really lift up and advance progressive priorities. Uh, what we do every single day of the week is really develop and advance priorities that put people first. And, you know, I know we're all reeling from this crisis. I know it's it's very personal for for all of us um, and that folks are being hit really, really hard. Um, and now more than ever, it's so important that we that we really think about how it is that we're going to put people first in the coronavirus response legislation that's moving through Congress to uh, protect all of us. Um, so we're gonna dig into that today. We're gonna talk about uh, what some of those ideas are. We're gonna talk about the legislation on the table. I know you know this is happening in real time. It's you know all there is in the papers, um, but first, I want to just kind of get real for a moment, talk about um, how things are going uh, in people's lives. And of course, I would love to hear from you about that. So, you know, I think um, one thing we know is this is this is hard on everyone. Uh, we know that this is uh, something that's going to require um, some long term coping strategies and, you know, we need to obviously, you know, we're at the Progressive Caucus Center uh, working overtime to address uh, this legislation uh, and to have make sure that progressives have a voice um, in, in uh, this process. But I also just want to be real and, and hear about what's going on in your life. So, um, Let's see, a couple things here. I am working now about five feet from a Keurig. That is really, really bad. I need to be socially distanced from my Keurig because um, this is maybe my seventh cup of coffee and it's three o'clock. So if it seems like I'm talking fast, uh, at some point I may need to switch to decaf and you know tell me um, if that moment has come. So um, one of the, you know, one of the things going on in this household is uh, I have three kids. One is a, uh, is a one and a half year old dog and then, um, and then a, a boy and a girl. And uh, so we're balancing the, trying to do the distance learning with um, trying to do our jobs. And, and my spouse is also uh, teleworking as well. I will say um, of my three kids, uh, the, the human ones have been uh, totally wonderful and the dog has been totally terrible, but we love him anyway. Um, and helpfully, my husband took him out for a walk uh, for uh, at least 20 minutes. So you are not going to hear him bark all the way through this call because that's how a lot of conference calls have gone so far. Um, so, uh, you know, some of the things that I've been thinking about on a personal level are the folks who are really at the front lines of this crisis. And I want to just say a quick, quick shout out uh, to our healthcare workers who are, you know, being inundated and for whom, you know, it is just uh, a travesty, the underinvestment in our, in our healthcare infrastructure and the lack of readiness um, 
uh, you know, that, that is really falling on them. Um, that is, that is really, uh, horrible and something that policy needs to fix immediately. Um, so just a huge shout out to all the healthcare workers out there who are going to work on the front lines, a shout out to the folks in the grocery stores who are working as cashiers, who are working 12 hour days, um, you know, in close proximity uh, to a whole lot of other people. This is hard work, it's dangerous work, and, and we're grateful, grateful for your work. Um, you know, there are so many uh, sectors of our economy, the folks who are delivering packages, right? Um, you know, where people are really putting themselves in harm's way to do the work uh, for all of us that, that needs done to sustain us in this time. Childcare workers, think about what they're going through. Um, so big shout out to folks who are on the front lines. Also, as somebody uh, who has very, very reluctantly begun homeschooling my children, uh, whoever said that our, our educators should earn a million dollars a year. I think you were right. So, um, so thank you, you know, just a personal thank you from all of us, uh, to folks who are, who are on the front lines. Um, I want to, uh, talk today about some of the real specifics that are happening, uh, in Congress right now. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we've learned from this crisis is that, uh, it really takes a toll uh, on all of us when we treat people like they don't matter. And the underinvestment, the chronic underinvestments in our communities uh, are, are um, having the effect of making this crisis so much worse than, than it otherwise would have been. Um, and right now, in this moment, we have to demand better. And that's what we're uniting with our friends across the progressive movement to do. Um, so I'm going to go over some of the, uh, some of the demands that we've been lifting up at the Congressional Progressive Caucus Center and some of the demands across the progressive movement. Um, and I want to just get a shout out and make sure that everybody can see me, uh, who's, uh, if you can see me and you're on, just let me know. I want to make sure that we're not having any technical glitches. So just let me know, um, via the comments if everything's looking good. Uh, so let me just stop and repeat for a second. I'm Liz Watson with the Congressional Progressive Caucus Center. And today I'm going to give you an update uh, about what's happening in Washington. I'm, I'm in my uh, home at my kitchen table, uh, but, but like many of you, uh, working really closely on what's happening on the front lines. Um, so... On March 6th, the first coronavirus response bill was signed into law. Uh, that was $8.3 billion focused on the immediate public health response. That's support for state and local public health agencies. It's money for supplies and testing that are so badly needed, research into treatment and a vaccine, and also loans for our small businesses who are really hurting. And that's something that we absolutely have to address. Um, and then uh, the second bill uh, last Wednesday was uh, signed into law on March 18th. And so let me talk about that one. Um, thank you to Lori Raymond for letting me know we're looking good. Uh, so the president signed the Families First Coronavirus Response Act into law on March 18th. This bill originally passed the House on the 13th and was not voted on by the Senate until five days later, which, which frankly... Um, you know, this is a situation that demands urgency, that demands our attention just as quickly as possible. So let me tell you what was in that um, piece of legislation, which is now law. So it included free testing for most patients, um, including some money to reimburse uh, people who are uninsured. It increased uh, uh, funding for Medicaid, helping more people access care while reducing the strain on state budgets. And it provided limited sick days uh, for some groups of people. So the original bill that was put forward uh, in, uh, in the House was really a very comprehensive approach to sick days and tried to provide that for as many people as possible. Um, the, the final bill uh, that, that was made into law you know, as a result of the negotiation was really whittled down. And so... Uh, here's what that provided. Um, 
paid sick days in the form of uh, two weeks um, and job protected paid leave for 10 weeks. Um, fall, and it, starting with employers can start with two weeks of unpaid leave, um, which can actually overlap with sick days to point that out. That's complex and the Department of Labor is going to be issuing um, guidance on that. And it's really for specific uh, groups of individuals. So it's important to look at who the paid leave applies to, um, such as parents who are home caring for children because of school closures, such as folks who are uh, under orders to stay home, such as people who are sick with the coronavirus. Um, so it's important to look at the provision specifically to find out whether, whether it applies to you. Um, it was significantly weakened uh, by Republicans to exclude employers with 500 or more employees, which kind of makes no sense because those are the employers who are, uh, you know, in many ways best situated uh, to to absorb this. Um, and so, you know, we're hearing about the warehouse workers, right, who are working sick. I just, uh, that was the first article I read this morning um, as soon as I woke up. Uh, you know, we don't want folks to work sick. You know, we know that when people work sick, other people are going to get sick. And so it's in all of our interest to make sure every single person has access to paid sick days and has access to paid leave. Um, so... I think this is something that everybody wants to take a close look at and of course something that, that we certainly are pushing to expand to be, be available to every single one of us. There are some exclusions in the bill uh, which um, you know really don't don't make a lot of sense, don't make any sense uh, and we need to we need to fight to cover everyone. Uh, the that piece of legislation also provided uh, grants to states to administer unemployment insurance. Frankly, with the layoffs that are already happening and the predictions about the jobless numbers by the end of the week, we need to do a lot more uh, to to protect people and to give people um, expand it to expand access to unemployment insurance. But in that piece of legislation, what it did was um, provide grants for the administration of the program. There's a lot more to do. Um, it also gave uh, grants to states to roll back work requirements and other barriers to access and also uh, provided technical assistance for states to set up work sharing programs. Those are programs that exist in 29 states and the District of Columbia that allow employers to provide uh, partial unemployment compensation to people whose hours are reduced. So for example, if instead of working five days a week, you're working three, the employer could apply for you to get partial unemployment for the two days, right, that you um, don't have work. So I hope that, I hope that's um, helpful. Uh, let's see, um, in terms of questions about uh, Food security, um, the, this piece of, this law um, provided funding focused on children and families and seniors. Um, and, you know, I just want to point out that the OSHA standard to protect healthcare workers, which is so badly needed right now, I mean, healthcare workers are, um, you know, absolutely in the lurch. We know that they don't have the personal protective equipment, the masks that they need. Um, you know, it's just a terrible thing. We need a standard and we need our government to provide the supplies uh, to meet that standard. So that's something that, you know, is being fought for right now. Um, and so why don't we fast forward uh, to talking about what's happening right now? Um, Right now, uh, negotiations are underway on the third coronavirus response legislation. And so that package is really changing by the minute. Um, I wanna give you a quick rundown on what's happening. Bear with me for a second, I have to drink some coffee. And I do see here that um, as I look at your questions, we're getting some really specific questions on um, what, what is being done to protect 
uh, people who are incarcerated, what is being done to protect people in detention. We know that people who are in close quarters are, are very much, uh, you know, potentially at risk because we have this government, you know, uh, instruction that we should all stay uh, six feet away from each other. And so those are things that, that we have been fighting for uh, to make sure that, that those are progressive priorities that get included in legislation and that we're continuing to fight for. Um, I know that the, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm simultaneously looking up some <laughs> regulations while I'm talking to you. Um, I know that in addition to that, um, what, uh, what the Progressive Caucus, which is the nearly 100 member uh, body in the House of Progressive members, um, has been fighting for is um, an end to um, it, it, uh, an, an end to ICE uh, ICE raids and roundups. Uh, looking at um, who in our uh, the population of folks who are incarcerated uh, is eligible for release and where that can, process can be sped up. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to go into making sure that we are protecting our folks who are the most vulnerable. And um, I really appreciate the commenter who raised that question. Uh, just, I was trying to pull up real quick for you. I don't know if I can do it on my phone here. Um, just to answer some of the more nitty gritty questions on the leave provision, because I do see those coming in. Hold on, just bear with me, I'm trying. Okay, my staff can tell you I'm barely, um, <laughs> we can just say I'm barely social media literate and here I am on my own doing this. So um, if you're on my comms team, Laura and Jess, just breathe and uh, we'll get through this together. Um, I'm sorry that you're not here to, to guide me. I bet I'm more sorry than you are. So, um, okay. So folks are asking me um, exactly who the emergency paid sick leave applies to. I, I really need uh, bifocals and obviously I'm not leaving my house to get them right now. So here I go. Um, so emergency paid sick leave, who um, is this going to apply to? Uh, it's gonna apply to, uh, and this is not legal advice that I'm giving you. This is just our best understanding where we're at. We are not giving you legal advice here. here. Um, our understanding is that the emergency paid sick leave that has been signed into law, um, uh, would apply to employers with fewer than 500 employees who are required to provide up to two weeks of paid sick time to any employee who is unable to work or telework for the following reasons. One, employee is subject to a local quarantine or isolation order. Two, employee has been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine. Um, employee has symptoms of COVID-19 and, and, and is trying to get that figured out. Um, care, if you're caring for someone uh, who is um, quarantined or isolated, that's a reason. Caring for a child um, because uh, the child care or, or, or a school closure, as millions of us are doing across the country, I, I am one, um, or, or other conditions that are going to be enumerated by the government and they haven't been enumerated yet. So that's that's the two weeks, right, of, of sick time. Um, and then we also have uh, some emergency family and medical leave um, uh, ex expansion. Um, and so that's the other uh, form of leave. Um, so hold on, just wait a second. I'm getting it, I'm getting it. Talk amongst yourselves. Um, so there is also um, the ability to take leave uh, to care for children pursuant to COVID-19 uh, related reasons um, as well. Uh, and so that's an amendment uh, to the FMLA. Um, that I think is really, really important. Um, and so that is additional leave uh, that is going to be required um, to be provided. So again, not legal advice. That's our best, our best read on the law. Okay, let's get back to where we were. What other questions are you asking me? So the things that we're 
um, fighting for. Let me, I'm, I'm seeing questions stack up in the queue. Let me tell you what's in, um, what's in uh, the third coronavirus response legislation, and then we will address um, the questions to the extent that those haven't been answered by what I, what I just said. So um, I, I, I see someone's talking about Senator Sanders calling for a moratorium on utility shutoffs and evictions and foreclosures. Uh, we are also calling for that. I know the Progressive Caucus is also calling for that. We're also calling for emergency rental assistance because we're trying to think about, you know, one of our principles and why a hashtag uh, that's across the progressive movement, let's make it trend people, that's a thing, right, um, is protect all people, is because we really need to make sure that in this legislation that we're putting forward, that we are really thinking about everyone's needs. So the needs of homeowners, the needs of people who are homeless, who need rapid rehousing, right, and, and we're calling for um, federal assistance to provide that. Uh, through some of the existing programs uh, to provide federal funds for people who are homeless. There are needs around stopping foreclosures and evictions, right? Um, so there's all of these things, that, and we always need to be thinking about, you know, are we actually making sure that this policy is going to meet everyone's needs? Um, and that paid sick days stuff I just talked about, it doesn't. I mean, and that's just real. And we need to expand dramatically um, the folks who are eligible. So... Uh, so negotiations, right? So this is both like, what are we fighting for, right? And then what is in what is in the current law? And we're having that conversation kind of simultaneously. Um, so I see. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Vernelia suggests um, let's think about making sure that there's assistance uh, from the bottom up. That the assistance I heard Elizabeth Warren say this beautifully, right, <laughs> goes to the grassroots and not to the treetops, right? And what does that look like? So we've actually done a lot of work and a lot of thought um, about this, right? So we're actually putting out pieces on conditions that should be placed on any industry aid, um, making sure that it flows to workers, making sure that it stops layoffs, making sure that it insists that benefits like health care, that sick days, retirement security are continued. So 100% agreement um, with Vernelia. Um, and so, okay, let's let's get to that um, third third package. So on the third package, negotiations are happening right now in this very moment. Um, and things are changing minute by minute. So uh, Senate Democrats um, outlined a plan that involved uh, $400 billion in emergency appropriations, uh, direct support to public health, health system capacity, state and local government aid. And this is so important. We have to help our state and local governments provide essential services. Um, small business assistance, education, child care, public transportation seniors, housing assistance, and infrastructure, including home internet access for our students. You know, I'm hearing about all these school systems requiring distance learning, right? And what are we doing for the kids who don't have access to internet? That's a problem that has to be solved immediately um, and assistance for the tribes. I wanna pause on the childcare point. Really, we can't say enough about the importance of assistance to our child care workforce. A lot of uh, federally funded child care assistance through our child care assistance programs is tied to um, the number of kids who are coming through their doors. And right now, we know, I think now six states across the country uh, have some kind of order either for everyone to stay home or a business order. That's the last number that I had when I looked in a bunch of uh, order that only essential businesses can function. Um, I also have seen that cities and states are putting these orders into place. So that means that kids um, are going to be staying home from childcare in many places. And it means that our providers, you know, who function on such thin margins, the um, most childcare providers earn under $12 an hour, just to give you some context there. And they do, uh, as Ai-Jen Poo from the National Domestic Workers Alliance likes to say, the work that makes all other work possible. So one of the groups when we think about our small businesses who we need to make sure we salvage in this crisis, let's think about our child care providers. And then let's think about our emergency first responders who are out there having to put their kids into care, shouldering all these new costs, right? Um, because schools are closed and they're putting their kids into care so they can go to work to clean the hospitals, uh, to, to care for uh, our, our friends, our family, uh, and 
they need childcare assistance and they need emergency assistance right now. So I just wanted to pause on that point to really tease that out because it is such a core, a core piece of all of this. Um, some of the other things that uh, that those folks were fighting for included public transportation, seniors, housing assistance, infrastructure, 300. And, so this is things that Senate Democrats were fighting for again in the uh, plans that they outlined. 350 billion for unemployment insurance expansion, including pandemic unemployment assistance for people not covered by regular unemployment insurance, um, as well as uh, benefits increases to our food stamps program and additional funding for Medicaid and student loan relief, um, six months of loan payment forbearance, no negative credit reporting. I'm going to pause there and say we are calling for full debt cancellation for our students uh, right now. Um, Frankly, in this crisis, we know the economic hardship that people are facing. Debt cancellation is a proposal uh, that we should be doing in good times um, to give people the ability uh, to get the education they need to move our economy and their families forward. And it's certainly a proposal that we should be doing right now. Um, uh, just wanted, Jessica says it looks good. So thanks, Jess, I appreciate that. That's our comms director. Um, whew, a little reassurance. Um, it's a little lonely over here. So um, uh, a moratorium on evictions and foreclosures was part of that Senate um, piece. And then in addition, um, strong conditions were laid out for aid to industry, worker protections for frontline workers, and the need to mobilize our Defense Department to address supply shortages um, that uh, we know are being faced in our hosp hospitals and to provide additional healthcare capacity. So what happened next? Um, so then, so we saw that happen uh, this past uh, Tuesday. And then on Thursday, Senate Republicans released a new uh, bill uh, uh, after talks with some Senate Democrats in the White House. So um, let me just pause here and say, this is the Congressional Progressive Caucus Center. What we're trying to do is provide uh, information to all of you about where things are in the process. We're at the third, third <laughs> relief package um, being negotiated, one of the um, most difficult times our country has ever faced, a time when we all need to come together and fight for the things uh, that every single one of us needs um, and, and fight for folks who are most vulnerable. Um, so, uh, the, the, so again, I'm Liz Watson with the Progressive Caucus Center. We are a group that lifts up the best thinking in the progressive movement that helps uh, to organize our movement partners to advance progressive policies. And frankly, there's never been a more important time to do this work. So, um, so going back to the Senate Republicans uh, release of their, of their legislation, uh, that bill, you know, was included um, giveaways uh, for industry, 500 billions with very few conditions and little oversight. Uh, it uh, went after reproductive rights and did not address the needs of frontline workers or immigrants um, and, and really was, was very threatening to our democracy in this time of crisis. Um, so as Folks probably heard um, the Senate refused to bring up the partisan uh, bill and uh, that bill failed uh, yesterday evening um, and again at 2 p.m. today. Um, so negotiations are continuing. Hold on just a second here. I have these weird pop-ups trying to sell me masks. Um, negotiations are continuing with efforts uh, to reach a bipartisan bill that puts people over profits and delivers the assistance that workers and their families need. You know, what we're looking for here, my friends, is a people's recovery. Um, I just, Jeff Cunningham, I see your point. Residential rents up to $2,000 should be eaten by landlords until the crisis is over. We are calling for um, 
the kind of rental assistance that's going to make it so that uh, folks are able uh, to cover their rent, so that folks are able uh, in a moratorium on evictions and foreclosures. No one should lose their home at a time like this. We need folks to stay housed, and and frankly, <laughs> this is not uh, you know the fault of the homeowners or the renters, right? Um, and, and they should not um, they should not be paying the price, and, but they already are. Um, so now there's a bigger opening, frankly, uh, for us to really advance a set of progressive priorities and to identify a set of pro progressive priorities that can be included um, in the negotiations. Uh, at 2 p.m. today, there was a bill introduced by House uh, or announced by House Democrats, and here's what um, some of the, the top lines are of that piece of legislation. Um, assistance to workers and small businesses, uh, requiring that any corporation that takes taxpayer dollars, and I, I know I've seen, I think it was, uh, oh gosh, I forget your name, was it uh, Ver Ver Vermilia, um, was saying that, um, I should have written it down, uh, that any corporation that takes taxpayer dollars must protect their workers' wages and benefits um, and can't be shoving that money into CEO pay, uh, stock buybacks, and, and certainly can't be uh, laying off workers. Um, it provides small business, provides for small business relief and strengthens unemployment insurance. Uh, that legislation also increases health care capacity and supports frontline workers. Coffee break. So, um, so what, so I think my dog has just come back. So just, uh, you know, warning, it's about to get really barky in here. Um, so increasing healthcare capacity and support for frontline workers that looks like funding for hospitals and other healthcare institutions to provide treatment and care to everyone who's sick and to ensure that our frontline, uh, workers have personal protective equipment. I have a friend who's a shift supervisor, or, um, a nurse who's a shift supervisor in a major city hospital, and she's telling me about, um, you know, how difficult it is to get the equipment that they need. Uh, it's so frightening to me to think about our frontline providers falling sick, and frankly, we owe it to them and to their families to do right by them and to provide the personal protective equipment that they need. Um, to our healthcare workers and to our first responders, like our grocery store workers, what kind of standards ought to be in place for them so that they aren't put at risk from standing uh, two feet away from customers all day long as they check out their items? Um, this uh, proposal requires the administration to enforce stronger occupational safety and health administration protections, and it calls for the president to invoke the Defense Production Act immediately. We, we, you know, we've heard about the Defense Production Act, right? But the president isn't putting forward any concrete plans on how we're going to use it to produce the things that are needed in hospitals across the country. That needs to be crystal clear immediately. Um, it provides for income support for families, direct payments to America's families, strengthens child care tax credits and the earned income tax credit. It gives more workers the security of guaranteed paid family and medical leave, including those caring for our seniors, and there are a lot of folks like that. Um, it makes coronavirus treatment free to the patient. So that's really important. It also provides um, assistance for schools and for students, um, nearly 400 billion into our schools and our universities with 300 billion directly provided to states to stabilize their funding for schools and nearly 10 billion to help alleviate the harm caused by coronavirus on higher education institutions while providing flexibility to continue their operations during the crisis. It helps current borrowers with their student debt bur burden. Again, we at the Progressive Caucus Center uh, do support debt can full student debt cancellation uh, for that and, and GI Bill benefits. It also bolsters food assistance and other initiatives to address food insecurity. It provides billions in grant funding for states through the Election Assistance Commission and a national requirement for both 15 days of early voting and no excuse absentee vote by mail, including mailing a ballot to all registered voters in an emergency. So vote by mail, 
um, or vote at home. Let's talk about that for a minute. That's something that we need to do now. We need to authorize the funds to allow states to immediately implement vote at home so that we can move forward with our elections. We've already seen states who've had to delay elections to protect the public health to protect people's safety, right? You shouldn't have to put your health at risk to exercise your right to vote. We need to immediately put things in place to provide uh, for our frontline workers, to provide for the folks who are right now feeling severe economic hardship and who are gonna continue to feel severe economic hardship from the fallout of this crisis. And frankly, we need to be able to exercise our right to vote. So guys, as you're out there pushing, can we please also include a push on vote at home so that we can hold our elections? This is the most fundamental piece of our democracy, right? And we need to, we need to ensure that we uh, do that. So I wanna just back up for a second Hold on for, and I'm seeing I'm seeing a commenter say, "What about require? What about allowing for vote at home?" Um, and yes, that's what we're talking about: absentee ballots, the ability to cast your vote by mail. We want to make sure that the federal government for, provides funding to get that up and running across the country. We have a number of states that already have it. We all need to get it immediately and put it in place. Hold on a second. You should go get a cup of coffee too, or maybe tea, because maybe we all need less caffeine in our lives. So, um, so just to remind you um, about who we are here at the Congressional Progressive Caucus Center. We are an organization that brings together the best thinking and organizing across the progressive movement to both develop progressive policies um, and move them forward. And we have been, you know, I would say one of the most um, encouraging things and really what's kept me going uh, and is just the amazing work of advocates across our movement of uh, folks who are going out there and fighting for what we believe in, who are fighting for all of us uh, to get through this crisis and, and who are doing the hard work, even though the circumstances are so tough. And I know they're tough uh, for everyone's families. And I just want to say thank you to people who are out there in the fight, you know, despite I know we all have very real worries and some of us um, have lost jobs. Some of us have uh, family members who've been affected uh, by the coronavirus. Some of us are petrified uh, for our family, for our seniors. I, I will confess that I bother my parents every single day about whether they're staying home because <laughs> um, unfortunately we don't live right next to them. And so uh, it's hard for me to know, but I bet all of you are doing the same thing. We all have all of those worries and yet people are pulling together and we're throwing down and, and that is really one of my favorite things about the progressive movement is the incredible work um, that, that people do in times of crisis and times of hardship and, and putting um, the needs uh, of our communities and our, our frontline communities first. So, um, so just a thank you for that. And then a little PSA here. I bet that by now almost everybody has seen, you know, the one or more viral videos circulating about what it looks like if we can slow this thing down through through pretty extreme social distancing measures, through basically sticking with whoever is in the place where we live, whoever is in our house, our apartment, right? Sticking with them, staying six feet apart from everybody else, um, not, not going out except for uh, exercise or, or something really essential like medical care of food. Um, you know, this is, this is hard. It's, it's hard. And, and it's easy to think, oh, well, you know, that applies to other people or I'm not at risk or, you know, et cetera. We as progressives know that's not the way to think. The way to think is how do my actions affect others? And so I want to say thank you to everyone who is making this sacrifice for our country. It is a sacrifice. And, and I really appreciate what everyone is doing. Um, we know that if we really put extreme measures into place, we can slow the curve and we will save people's lives.
And that is up to all of us. And, and we, we have to double down on our commitment um, and, and, you know, batten down the hatches and, and really tighten up. Um, and, it, and it's been hard. We've been having those conversations in my own household with my kids about what that means. Um, and I just want to say thank you to all of you for the, the work that you're doing. I know it can be isolating. Um, frankly, I'm so glad to interact with all of you here on Facebook Live. And, and thank you um, for, for bridging uh, the distance with me virtually. And we're going to continue to do that, to bridge the distance, to share with you what's going on um, and to hear from you what you're concerned about. Don't forget, I want your recommendations of books for my kids. I'll take movie recommendations as well. Um, so some of the things that we are really working for, I want to highlight um, what some of the work that's happening in the progressive movement and what we're really lifting up uh, here at the Congressional Progressive Caucus Center. Uh, we have been lifting up uh, issues around immediate cash assistance. This is, in other words, looking for immediate started targeted monthly payments. Uh, we've called for $2,000 to each adult, up to an additional $1,000 for families um, with ch uh, children for six months uh, with uh, the ability to extend payments if this crisis and economic hardship continues. We need to put money in people's pockets now. We know people are hurting. We know that bills are coming due. We need to put money in their pockets, immediate cash assistance, it can't be the only thing. It's one part of the solution and we need to do it now. And frankly, it's really easy to do. So let's just do it. Let's do it right now so that we can stop uh, people from suffering any more than they already are. Um, on housing assistance, we're calling for a nationwide moratorium on evictions and foreclosures. We're calling for emergency uh, rental assistance, and we're calling for emergency funding for rapid rehousing for folks who are homeless. Um, we're also, I wanna, um, I wanna say that one of the things that we've really been thinking about is how do we prevent layoffs? And I think where we think about that, some of the ideas uh, that we're really, uh, advancing are the idea that every state should offer robust uh, work sharing programs for workers whose hours are cut or reduced down to zero uh, to maintain their payrolls um, and stop layoffs, right? So we can use our existing systems to deliver a payroll subsidy uh, to employers who promise that they will then use that subsidy and not just promise, but that's the only reason that the unemployment insurance uh, uh, money can be used uh, through the work sharing system to then deliver that so that workers can get a paycheck um, and will continue to receive their health care and uh, other benefits. Um, so that's something that, that we're pushing for. We're pushing for dramatically expanded disaster unemployment in insurance, uh, disaster unemployment assistance to cover self-employed individuals and anyone else who would not be eligible for regular unemployment insurance to relax all of the restrictive eligibility requirements on unemployment insurance so that as many people as possible can benefit from the program. We need to keep people in their jobs. That's what we need to do. And frankly, a lot of people can't go to work, right? It's not possible because either your workplace is shut down, the government has said you can't leave your house, you've got school closures going on, right? So what do we need to do right now? We need to pay people to stay home. And there's a few different creative solutions to do that. Cash assistance is one way. A dramatic expansion of unemployment insurance is another way. Um, basically a payroll subsidy that is going to go straight to workers. So these are some of the ideas that we, the progressive ideas that we are really excited about uh, putting on the table and, and lifting up. Um, we believe that all of these additions to unemployment insurance should basically be federally funded for the duration of the crisis. Um, the federal government needs to, needs to pay for this, needs to pay people to stay home. Um, that's in all of our interest, in the public health interest as well. Um, I want to talk about some of the red lines around conditions on industry aid that we would like to see. Um, 
we would like to see industry aid that saves jobs for workers. So the, the main condition is don't lay off your workers, right? That, that needs to be there and saves jobs for contractors and make sure that money to industries does not go to stock buybacks, does not go to executive bonuses or, or executive pay, any type of executive compensation um, and, or, or to shareholder dividends. Um, we ought to condition any industry aid on respect for existing collective bargaining agreements on providing paid leave and continuing health care um, and safety protections, uh, bankruptcy protections for workers and retirees, um, and capping executive pay at 50 times the pay of the median worker. Uh, so student loan assistance, uh, we're calling for full debt cancellation. We're also calling for a moratorium on all negative credit reporting. Um, we're, uh, so those are some of the things that we would like to see uh, happen on student loan assistance. Certainly people should not be penalized uh, or have um, failure to make payments count against them um, toward completing public service loan forgiveness or anything like that. Um, we also need to talk about, uh, hi Barbara, we also need to talk about what we're going to do in terms of assistance to small businesses and nonprofit organizations. Uh, we need to think about direct cash assistance uh, or grants to small businesses and nonprofit organizations, uh, independent contractors, sole proprietors, and gig economy workers, right? We need to protect our small businesses uh, and nonprofits from evictions, utility shutoffs, and the other impacts uh, that are likely to come from an inability to pay bills or loans due to, um, you know, frankly, the public health emergency that is, is requiring businesses, except for essential businesses, to shut down. Uh, so I want to talk about free testing, treatment, and prevention, because this absolutely has to be, hold on, um, inconveniently, my computer just turned off, so... Um, one of the things I've been asking for, and maybe my friend Barbara, who just joined, will help me out here. Um, one of the things <laughs> I've been asking uh, all of you for is to give me some book recommendations or, or for my kids and some movie recommendations. Uh, and so I'm hoping that I am going to pick up some of those here on this call. If somebody on my team wants to redirect me to um, some of the some of the notes that I had. Uh, put together here, that probably would be helpful. Um, so, uh, so um, picking up one of the questions that we're being asked here is, do we, are we working on trying to stop layoffs? Yes, absolutely. I absolutely think we need to stop layoffs. Hi, Liz. Uh, as far as, as far as layoffs, stopping layoffs goes, you know, there's a number of different proposals on the table. I think we need to think in terms of payroll subsidies, um, different ways to do that, but basically to deliver payroll subsidies to keep people on payrolls as long as we possibly can. Um, so that is absolutely something that's that the progressives are calling for. Um, another question that I got asked is, how old are my kids? They're nine and 13. Thank you for asking. Um, so, uh, so, um, and, and they're being extremely well behaved, which is mostly because they are spending a lot of time on their electronic devices. Um, <laughs> uh, so some of the other things, oh, right. Some of the other things that we're calling for um, uh, in, terms of, in terms of next steps, we're calling for free testing, treatment, and prevention. Um, covering uh, coronavirus treatment, testing, and prevention at no out-of-pocket cost, whether the patient is covered by private health insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, TRICARE, or the Indian Health Service. Remember, uh, we have been calling for Medicare for all for a very long time, and I think this is a chickens come home to roost situation. Um, again, I started this call with saying we all pay the price when we treat people like we don't matter, like they don't matter. And when we don't provide health care for folks. Um, you know, we open ourselves up to a situation where we're in a pandemic, we are all at greater risk. Uh, and so we need to immediately cover everyone who is without coverage. Um, 
Additional resources for hospitals, community health centers, and clinics are critical. We need to provide protections for our frontline workers in healthcare and in other sectors. We can use the national disaster medical system to cover coronavirus-related care for uninsured people through Medicare and emergency appropriations to cover the state share of Medicaid and to alleviate strain on state budgets during this crisis. Um, we need to put in place protections for our most vulnerable communities, uh, including free testing treatment and prevention, regardless of immigration status. We need to have best practice developed by public health and medical professionals to prevent outbreaks uh, for people who are incarcerated, for people who are in detention. And we need to put a stop to immigration arrests and detention for people who pose no risk to the public safety, and that needs to stop immediately. Um, identifying appropriate individuals, uh, particularly those most vulnerable, uh, to falling ill uh, for release on recognizance, reasonable bond, or other appropriate measures. Um, and we need to relax immigration deadlines uh, until at least three months following this outbreak. Um, it is just not possible for people um, to, to follow those deadlines right now. So let's talk about paid leave for a moment. I, I said that some paid leave has been signed into law, but there's a lot more to be done. Uh, the, you know, letting businesses that have 500 uh, or more employees off the hook is just crazy. Um, these are the businesses actually who can most afford to provide paid leave. And the way that the uh, paid leave uh, system functions is to provide uh, some reimbursement for employers. So, um, uh, it makes zero sense whatsoever. And so we need to make sure um, uh, that we provide paid leave for everyone. Right now, um, there is uh, an ability for small employers to submit for a hardship exemption to opt out. Um, I'm a small employer. I can tell you we should not be able to opt out. We can provide, we can apply uh, for the reimbursement, but we should not be able to opt out. Um, we don't need a federal subsidy for employers uh, with more than 500 employees, um, but we do need to cover everyone. And we need to expand the reasons that people can take paid leave to encompass all the things that we know people are doing, like taking care of their parents. Um, we need to provide significant support for children and families right now. We know that there are so many uh, uh Ch families who need emergency child care assistance who are on the front lines of this crisis, our health care workers, our grocery store workers, our folks who are delivering uh, food and, and other needed medical supplies and toys and all of the things that are coming to people's houses at a very rapid pace. Um, those folks should be eligible for emergency child care assistance. Schools are shut down, I think, in 46 states, if I remember correctly. Somebody just tell me if I got that one wrong. Um, so schools are shut down across the country. And what are we going to do for people? We need to provide emergency child care assistance. We also need to make sure that for our child care providers, and a lot of these folks are uh, small businesses. They're people earning uh, less than $12 an hour. They're women um, who are really going to suffer through no fault of their own if the child care assistance funding that they receive drops because there aren't people coming through their doors. Um, again, I'll quote Ai Jen Poo uh, another time, child care, she says, care work is the work that makes all other work possible. When we can turn the lights on and people can go back to work, we're going to want those child care providers to be ready to go and ready to reopen their doors. So let's make sure that we fund them um, and we fund them not based on how many people are, are walking through their doors, but based on enrollment. So that's really critical. Um, we need to make sure as we support children and families that we're providing significant food assistance uh, that is so badly needed right now in terms of increasing SNAP benefits and removing all barriers to access. And let me tell you, um, so you have a former legal services attorney sitting here who's dealt with a lot of work requirements over the years that have been barriers to access to basic, basic uh, things that families need to get by. Right now, every work requirement associated with any public benefit needs to stop. People, We don't want to, people to go to work. We want to pay people to stay home. There is no 
there never was any value in these work requirements and there is no case whatsoever to be made for them right now. So they all need to be completely axed entirely. Um, so election integrity. Uh, I want to talk about this for a second. I want to go back to the point about uh, the need to make sure that people can vote at home. Look, while we're fighting for all the resources that our frontline workers need, that our healthcare system needs to treat people, um, we and fighting for the resources that our families need to get by in our communities, we need to also fight to make sure that we can hold elections. And so vote at home is an idea, uh, the idea of absentee ballots whose time <laughs> came, along, uh, came a long time ago, but we need to do it right now. We need to provide significant federal resources uh, to states to immediately implement vote at home programs to provide the prepaid uh, postage uh, on envelopes that can go out uh, to every voter in order to allow people to cast their vote. Voting is the most fundamental right of our democracy. As we're all uh, telling lawmakers what it is that we want to see out of a coronavirus policy response, don't forget to include protect our democracy. Please make it possible for people to vote at home. Um, I'm seeing Janet, who's making a really good point. Janet is saying families are so close to the edge and these quarantine measures mean they can't go to work. We need immediate income support for those families. And I, I couldn't agree more. And it's the sensible thing to do. We need to pay people to stay home. Can we make that a hashtag, pay people to stay home? Ask my social media people, they probably hate it. Um, but, you know, that's what we ought to be doing, right? We ought to be providing cash assistance. We ought to be providing unemployment insur insurance assistance. We ought to be making sure that any industry aid requires keeping people on payroll. We ought to be providing comprehensive paid sick days and paid leave in order to pay people to stay home. That is how we bend the curve on this virus. We need to do it immediately. Um, in addition, we need to provide resources for Indian country. We need to ensure that all federal coronavirus resources include tribes, tribal organizations, and urban Indian organizations. We need to create a tribal relief fund to address coronavirus and provide impacted businesses with emergency relief. Um, so I heard that Vernelia also has a nine-year-old grandson. Um, I hope he's doing okay uh, right now as well. I know it's, I know it's a really hard time uh, for a lot of our kids. Um, uh, let's see, Michelle. I'm gonna try to. Oh, let's see if I can see the rest of your question. Um, we are so Michelle is asking such an important question. Um, so Michelle's an advocate, uh, Michelle Liang, and she's asking, are we including undocumented people who are undocumented? Um, uh, within these these provisions. Um, look, we're seeing uh, people who are undocumented and a lot of the things that are going forward get left out and we are calling for them to be included in every single piece of coronavirus policy response legislation that moves forward. So we are making that call. We know that this virus, it doesn't, it's not paying attention to whether people uh, are undocumented or not, right? And we need our policy response not to be looking at that. We need to make sure that we're meeting everyone's needs. That's how we bend the curve. It's how we keep our families and our communities safe. Um, I want to talk about a, a couple of other uh, questions uh, or a couple of other uh, quick uh, things that we're really fighting for. So we've heard a lot of talk about the Defense Production Act. We've heard that there's you know a lot of things in short supply, uh, ventilators, masks. Uh, we're hearing about um, a need for all these things. So we need to provide funding and require the administration to submit a plan to Congress, right, uh, for the use of De Defense Production Act authorities, including targets and timelines for the production of supplies. And frankly, uh, we're going to have to have a plan in place 
really quickly around uh, how we're going to provide training for folks um, who are needed where there are worker shortages in these essential industries and in these frontline industries because we're already hearing um, about folks calling up uh, temporary workers to provide health care services, for example. And, and we need to be thinking about that now um, so that we're ready. So there is absolutely uh, so much that we all we all need to do and that we all need to want that we all want done. We're seeing this happen in real time. We're seeing this play out in real time in Congress. We urge you to continue to make your voices heard. Uh, we urge you to continue to stand up for for uh, people, right? To say that any recovery needs to put people first. Uh, there are a couple of hashtags right now uh, that that folks are talking about. Uh, one of the thing, one of the hashtags. I'm going to try to remember these off the top. One is hashtag people over profits. Um, I got that one right. One is hashtag people over profits. I might only be able to give you one. Um, so we encourage you uh, to use hashtag people over profits. We encourage you uh, to follow closely on our Facebook page for opportunities to take action. Many of you are also a part of our email list. Um, on our email list, and if you want to sign up for our email list, uh, you can message us right now to do that. Um, I will tell you that our email list is a way that we get out information about how to take action, about what's moving, and about the need uh, the needs to support our communities. Uh, thank you, thank you. Jess says the other hashtags. Woohoo! Our hashtag what we need, right? What we need, and that's what are our progressive priorities, right? What we need. We need to protect all people. And that's another hashtag. Hashtag protect all people. Um, hashtag what we need. Uh, hashtag uh, uh, people over profits. These are hashtags uh, that are out there right now as we're doing our advocacy, as we're fighting uh, for our communities, as we're fighting to make sure that a relief package is relief for the people who need it no most and it's not uh, it's not funneled uh, into CEO paychecks or funneled into stock buybacks. Uh, we need you all to, to fight alongside us. And I want to express again my gratitude uh, to those of you who joined this call. I want to, um, and then just on a human level, I know this is hard and we're all in this together. Um, please do get in touch with us. Please let us know how you're doing. We want to hear from you. Uh, this is this is a crisis. It's a hard moment, um, and we're going to get through it together. And that's what we, as a progressive movement, know how to do. We were, we were frankly uh, made to do this. We're we're made for moments when we have to pull together and when we have to fight uh, for the needs for every single one of us. So, I'm I'm honored to be in this fight alongside you. I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful um, for your work. And uh, let's let's keep in close touch um, and and thank you all for what you do every single day. Um, love to everybody out there. Bye bye.